Welcome to another episode of the Megan Spotlight series. Today we are delighted to have Dr. Vladimir Litvak as our guest. He is the Senior Research Associate at the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging at UCL's Institute of Neurology. Dr. Litvak is responsible for developing EEG MEG analysis methods. Hi Vladimir, thank you for joining us today. Hi, it's great to be here. So the Wellcome Center for Human Neuroimaging at UCL focuses on the collection of methods that investigate human brain structure and function. As a senior researcher at the center, you are heavily involved in work concentrating on cortico-subcortical communication. Please explain your work to our listeners in a bit more detail. So uh, we are working with patients who are undergoing surgery for deep brain stimulation. Uh, it's uh, when neurosurgeons implant uh, electrodes in the uh, deep brain structures in a precisely uh, targeted manner. And this is done to relieve symptoms of uh, a range of neurological and psychiatric disorder, disorders of which uh, most common is uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and for us, for researchers, it's an opportunity to look at uh, the activity of those uh, structures that are usually uh, difficult to assess uh, non-invasively. And uh, I'm particularly interested in how this uh, deep, uh, deep brain stimulation targets communicate with the rest of the brain. Uh, and uh, I use MEG to record from, from those uh, from the rest of the brain, basically, from cortex and other structures. So your team was the first in the world to combine invasive recordings from wires implanted in the brain, also called deep brain stimulation or DBS, with non-invasive recordings using MEG. Why did you decide as a team to use MEG and how does it benefit your work? So uh, MEG has some unique advantages to this kind of studies. Uh, and the main of those is that uh, it's uh, uh, contactless. So the patients uh, who are fresh, like one or two days after surgery, so they have uh, fresh stitches and uh, holes have been drilled in their head. So at that point, to try to place uh, electrodes on their skin is quite challenging and they find it uncomfortable. And this is especially a problem if you want to, to do source localization and you want to, uh, to record from uh, a large number of sensors around uh, the whole uh, uh, scalp. So uh, MEG is different in the sense that it only requires the patient to place their head in the door and uh, there's much less contact and less uh, discomfort. Uh, another issue is uh, being able to perform precise uh, source localization uh, uh, in the people uh, for, whom, for whom the skull connectivity is different because of those holes and uh, surgical wounds. So in that sense, MEG is also advantageous because it, it's not sensitive to uh, skull connectivity. Uh, there are also some uh, disadvantages which are unique to make in our situation. And the main one being that it's uh, very sensitive to the presence of paramagnetic metal. Uh, and uh, there is some metal uh, in those patients uh, after surgery. And it's also more sensitive to stimulation artifacts from deep brain stimulation than, uh, than let's say, EEG. And our groups, a group and other groups, we, we work to find workarounds uh, for these problems. and. Uh, and uh, we, we managed to, to record the uh, useful data even uh, in the presence of those artifacts. So uh, I'd like to especially mention one method, which is uh, what is called uh, uh, TSSS or Max Filter software, uh, which is uh, which was developed uh, by Megan or uh, Electa, as it was called then. And uh, that's one of the tools that uh, we, uh, we could use when uh, acquiring data on the, on the Electa Megan system uh, to suppress uh, artifacts and noise. And uh, I worked with uh, Samo Taolo, who, who used to be at Electa, but now he's back in academia. And uh, we also we spoke from the company who, are, uh, who developed a, a prototype code for this uh, method. And we took the toolbox and uh, managed to publish uh, it as open source uh, tool. So it's now distributed uh, with, with our uh, mega analysis package that is being developed in our department. And uh, many people find it useful for, for for problems such as uh, DBS artifact suppression. Well, the Max Filter is a powerful workstation for data acquisition and post-processing of measurements for MEG users. So this is quite an achievement and exciting for you to have been involved in this development, I would think. Um, let's move on to what MEG has helped you achieve specifically in your studies. What are the key findings of your research that were enabled by the use of MEG? Yeah, so I, I think the main difference that MEG made uh, is uh, being able to topographically map uh, those uh, oscillatory connectivity networks between deep uh, structures and particularly the cerebral cortex. 
uh, that we are studying. So basically, it was known before I started my research uh, that deep uh, structures communicate with superficial structures via coherent uh, or correlated oscillatory activity. But uh, how many such coherent networks there are and uh, what exactly are the cortical structures involved that wasn't known. And the uh, high spatial resolution of MEG uh, made it possible for us to, uh, to precisely map those structures to show that uh, networks with different frequencies that are specific to different cortical targets. And also, in some cases, there are uh, several networks with the same frequency, which communicate with different targets. And uh, this kind of, of uh, this kind of disting distinctions uh, were not possible before we started using uh, MEG. Uh, and uh, in our most recent paper, which was led by Ashwini Oswal, who is uh, my former PhD student, uh, he managed to correlate uh, high resolution uh, coherence mapping from MEG with uh, structural connectivity maps and uh, make a link between uh, start this kind of structure and functional connectivity analysis to, to show which specific anatomical networks are related to particular patterns uh, of uh, communication. So UCL's neuroimaging unit also utilizes MEG technology in other areas of research, as you've told me. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about where MEG is being added as a modality in research at UCL and why? Uh, so our department is, uh, is focusing on cognitive uh, neuroscience. Uh, so there are groups which uh, work on memory and language uh, and uh, uh, visual perception and, and other kind of classical cognitive topics and uh, doing cognitive tasks in the MEG. There are several uh, directions which are unique uh, to our department, which I think it's interesting to focus on. Uh, so the first of them is a so-called uh, dynamic causal modeling, uh, which is a method uh, being developed in, in the methods group uh, uh, led by Professor Carl Friston. And uh, the idea there is that you can combine the, uh, combine uh, uh, data analysis and uh, computational modeling uh, to fit uh, models to data and make inference about the mechanisms that generate this data, for instance, about uh, 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 strengths of particular uh, synapses connecting uh, different cell types uh, in the cortex, etc. Uh, the second direction is uh, what, uh, what we call uh, precise anatomy for MEG. Uh, so this is something that uh, was led by Garrett Barnes and uh, Sven Bestman in our department. And uh, they use uh, head cast, so basically molds that fit uh, individual subjects very well and fit the MEG scanner. And the idea was to, to keep the head perfectly still and uh, be able to know where it is with uh, sub-millimeter precision. Uh, and uh, then uh, they managed to show that particular kinds of oscillatory activity come from particular layers uh, in the cortex. And this kind of layer-specific uh, 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 resolution of MEG, this is something which, uh, very new and uh, people find uh, exciting to answer different questions about how uh, brain areas communicate. Uh, and uh, now uh, there's a lot of work also by Garrett Barnes on uh, new MEG sensors on uh, optical pump magnetometers. Uh, and we have a special uh, large uh, and high quality shielded room that is used for, for this kind of uh, research. Uh, and this particular aim of uh, looking at uh, naturalistic environment, naturalistic movement, uh, and uh, naturalistic task. And, uh, uh, finally, there's also a very interesting, exciting uh, application of MEG uh, developed by uh, Ray Dolan and Tim Behrens at UCL. And this is uh, studying the so-called hippocampal replay. And uh, I don't want to get into really the, too much into details of this, uh, this is quite complex. Uh, but the main idea is that uh, they use machine learning tools, uh, classifiers, uh, to find out the moments when the when particular representation is activated in the brain. So for instance, uh, a particular picture uh, that the volunteer has seen before. And it turns out that uh, the brain can go through sequences uh, of such a presentation in a very specific uh, manner, uh, even at rest or when the subjects are just preparing uh, to do a task. Uh, and uh, by studying this, this kind of, uh, the way that the sequences are replayed uh, in the brain, uh, it can be related to what we know already from theoretical studies in uh, machine learning and uh, reinforcement learning, and also to studies in animals. Uh, and uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest now to find out exactly how people uh, use this mechanism and how it can break down in different uh, neurological and psychiatric uh, disorders. And to do this kind of research, uh, it's especially important to use the multi-dimensional uh, multi measurements 
uh, of MEG because that's what uh, makes the classifiers work better and uh, uh, separate between different patterns uh, with high degree of uh, accuracy. So this leads me into actually the next question is how you how would you describe the future of MEG technology and advances you predict in machine learning and AI in your research field? Yeah, so I see two main roles of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning when we talk about MEG. So one is just simply as a tool for data analysis uh, that is already being used by, by many research groups. And uh, that can uh, help us to realize the full potential of MEG, uh, for instance, in uh, clinical diagnosis. Uh, and, uh, and the other is uh, basically artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence is giving us ideas about uh, how different brain me uh, mechanisms could operate. And these are ideas that we could test uh, using MEG as, as, as well as other tools. And uh, I particularly like the idea of uh, virtual uh, virtual uh, cycle uh, between neuroscience and artificial intelligence. So this is idea suggested by Demis Hassabis, who is the founder of uh, Google DeepMind, uh, where basically we can learn from uh, from the brain to to inform uh, AI, AI research, and we can learn from AI to to, get, to generate hypotheses about the brain. And uh, research such as what I just mentioned about uh, replay is kind of an example of uh, work in this direction. Yeah, that's quite fascinating. Um, as a senior researcher and lecturer using MEG frequently in your studies, can you offer any advice to research or medical students about why MEG is an interesting modality and how to break into this field, or how do you contribute to furthering the MEG field at UCL? So I, I think, and the other people that I talked to also agree with that, that I think the best thing about MEG is the MEG community. Uh, which is very, uh, very good people and uh, welcoming uh, to, to new researchers. Uh, and uh, I think I would suggest that MEG is particularly interesting uh, in people with technical background who are interested in uh, getting to neuroscience and studying the brain uh, because uh, it, it can produce very rich uh, data. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, it's also non-invasive and safe. So there, there are less difficulties with getting access and acquiring uh, this high, high data qu uh, quantities that could be, let's say, with invasive uh, measurements. Uh, and uh, I think people uh, who are not from technical background, they could benefit from kind of boosting their knowledge in, uh, in things like uh, linear algebra, particularly, or programming, uh, just to better understand the data analysis, which is uh, like a really important aspect of uh, MEG research. And once they get into the field, I would just uh, suggest that they don't get intimidated initially by uh, like different technical jargon uh, and the uh, discussion about uh, technical details and just wait until they, they become seasoned enough to, to understand what people are talking about. And then they could see if this kind of research is something they would enjoy uh, doing for their career. Uh, and uh, uh, my own work to, to help uh, people in the field has to do with my role as a software developer as part of the metals group uh, at the Welcome Center. So we are developing a toolbox, open source toolbox called Statistical Parametric Mapping uh, Toolbox. So this is uh, this toolbox is already quite old. It started uh, uh, early 90s uh, with PET and fMRI. And then uh, later uh, we added also a capability to analyze EEG and MEG. And uh, we also around this uh, toolbox, we organize different training activities. So most uh, known is a uh, Statistical Parametric Mapping course. Uh, which we run usually once a year, but uh, this year already, because we missed last year, we did uh, two uh, online courses and we'll probably uh, keep doing online events also in the future. And uh, this is something that I think newcomers and also experienced researchers uh, find uh, quite useful. That sounds good. Vladimir, thank you so much for making time for us today. Um, it's been really informative and, and a great insight into how you're utilizing MEG at UCL and, and, and the Welcome Center. Um, thanks again for your time. Thank you for inviting me.